Hey everyone, and welcome to the private podcast from studio The Other London, where we plug in and explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Derek E. Silva. Today, joining me on the private podcast is Steve McCloskey. Steve is the founder and CEO of Nanome, a company that builds virtual reality solutions for scientists and engineers working at the nanoscale, specifically protein engineering and small molecule drug development. We also dive into Bitcoin, his journey into cryptocurrency and decentralized science. And now over to the conversation with Steve McCloskey. All right. And we are here with Steve McCloskey. Steve, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day uh, this early in your day to, to spend some time with us here on the private podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Derek. Um, yeah, yeah, bright and early on the West Coast over here. Uh, but yeah, digitally connected, just like uh, all good things. And, and yeah, happy to be here. Good. Yeah, we, we were talking earlier uh, before we started recording about crypto and uh, some of the recent it's it's May 12th today. So some of the recent um, volatility uh let's say we might get into that later you're you're you actually you've you've been in this even longer than i have so definitely want to talk a little bit about that uh but first we want to talk about your, your the primary reason you're on the show which is about your uh the virtual reality solutions you're building for scientists uh you know you're the founder and ceo of a company which i, I already mentioned so let's let's first hear uh, a little bit about your background and what inspired you to pursue a career in the field of nano engineering please yeah, um, you know, grew up, uh, was always kind of into science, uh, chemistry. I had a lot of uh, spots of cancer in my family and, um, you know, really wanted to, to do something to help the world and, you know, cure cancer, right? He, as a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, you know, curing cancer seems kind of vague. It's like, oh, maybe I'll like mix the right chemicals together and like come up with a cure. Um, yeah, that was kind of how I thought about it at the time. I, I thought people were just kind yeah. of blind guessing. Um, but yeah, I figured I'd, I'd study uh, some cool stuff. And um, in high school, I got really into renewables, converted my car to run off vegetable oil with my dad, um, who's, wow. who's also an engineer. And um, yeah, I just went into college actually to study biochem chemistry um, at UC San Diego. And uh, my first quarter there, I realized that we had the first nano engineering department in the world. And I was like, nano engineering, you know, what, what is this? This sounds pretty cool. And, um, you know, took an intro class with uh, the department chair uh, that kind of founded the department there and, um, you know, learned what nano engineering was. And it was gold nanoparticles to, to cure cancer and like, you know, all this like crazy biotech of uh, functionalizing different biomolecules and, and, you know, having them, that's all nanoscale material sciences for, for renewables, better solar panels, better batteries. Um, you know, just really everything's nanoscale. And so if you understand yeah. what's going on at the nanoscale, you could just do so much more to help people, um, whether that's on the biomedical side or if that's on um, you know, the material side and, and other areas. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just got really excited about that, started working with that same professor in his lab. And, um, yeah, I just uh, learned a lot, used electron microscopes, actually, you know, see atoms and, and molecules and all that. And um, you know, different types of experimental characterization, like X-ray crystallography. And, uh, you know, really going through that whole thing, I was super into gaming, also growing up, and I just wanted something better. And so that's where all the virtual reality side kind of came together with the nano engineering. Um, I was looking at Nanom's website, and um, I have to ask this question only to get your perspective on it. Um, so... I... I think there have been all sorts of people and Bond villains and and you know like other super mo super villains in, in movies and stuff like that. But in real life, you know, accusations around the uh, the WHO driven lab in in Wuhan, uh -huh. China, about synthetic engineering, right? Being yeah. able to create super viruses, super bugs, etc. Mm -hmm. Because of all the new technology that's coming on board, we have CRISPR, of course, which lets you insert all sorts of, you know, DNA into uh, another creature of some kind and and change, you know, their their molecular structure. Do you do you ever get worried that nanomes technology might be used for that? Do you have any protection in place for that or like are you just doing like super amounts of screening for clients to make sure that they are legit and not looking to use your technology for for ill purposes? Well, well, that, that is what we do. Yeah, we, we definitely uh, you know, know our customers and, and you know work with yeah you know, the good guys, right? And we're providing tools for the industry. So you know it's it's a hammer, it's it's a wrench. You know, can a hammer or a wrench be used? 
in, in bad ways, like, of course, you know, but like also yeah. these are, these are functional tools that you need to build a house and, and to make things. Um, so on our end, yeah, working with the good guys, um, you know, I want to spin up like a biodefense DAO and like start preparing for the worst because it's entirely possible to make bioweapons. It's it's happening. It's yeah. part of part of our reality now. And I think that if you get ahead of the curve and you start building in ways to defend against future potential threat vectors, biological you know, vectors um, that could be, you know, engineered to to be worse um they could even just be natural like literally there's so many natural reservoirs of different um you know species or different you know populations out there um where these things could go pandemic it w without the you know uh creation of a, a lab that's that's trying to you know crispr or do any uh, type of um you know experiments that would make it uh, more infectious to humans and, and things like that like you know that could happen as well um but then in the day there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And if, and if you want to stop that, you need a lot of smart people working on ways to cure and prevent future pandemics and, and future you know, potential bioweapons as well. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So I, I guess on that, on that, from that end, can you tell us a little bit more about Nanome, what you guys do, how did, how the company came, came to be and all that? Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was a nano engineer into gaming and, and ordered a uh, Oculus uh, Rift development kit and uh, was just like, all right, is VR the thing? Because I'd actually tried VR in like 1997. I was a little kid, you know, under 13, right? I was like virtual seven Virtual Boy doesn't count, seven. if that's what you're talking about. Like the Nintendo <laughs> Virtual Boy was not a good no, attempt no, no. at VR by any means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was actually at Six Flags Magic Mountain in LA, and it, oh, okay. it was the full, it was the full big helmet. You know, you got to like do all this, this stuff. You know, had a nice big computer powering it. I'm sure, okay. and um, it was awesome. Yeah, big, I went in there and I'm Pentium like, two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 400 megahertz Pentium 2 with 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 one gigabyte of RAM. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I think it was silicon graphics actually. Um, oh, okay, that yeah. makes more sense. And SGI, yeah, and yeah, chip would, would definitely. Yeah, exactly. Everyone there. talks about SGI and the um, in the drug development space because they, they they were trying to use the 3D glasses back then with the SGI machines. Um, but yeah, I, I tried a, a good VR experience. You know, the best that you could get in 1997, basically, which was like okay uh, it's pretty bad by today's standards um but as a kid in the 90s it was mind-blowing there was nothing like that you know it was, it was yeah. playstation one it was nintendo 64 and then it was full immersive stuff and and that memory always stuck with me i tried it for maybe 20 minutes or something um but you know playing video games and just going through i was like what was that 3d thing like how do you do that and um kind of put down the back of my head until i saw the uh the oculus kickstarter and was like, maybe this will be the thing that, you know, mm -hmm. had that full three dimensional. And I was like, well, if this is what I want it to be, then I'll be able to put it on. I'll be able to like be interacting with molecules and, and things at the nano scale and you know, get hands on with it. And that's what it was. It was, you know, you put on the headset and, and you have it right in front of you. We didn't have hand controllers at the time, but, you know, that was I was using like leap motion and doing hand tracking. And then I got. These yeah. things called Razor Hydras as well, which were like these wired six degree freedom controllers that were just super clunky. Um, but yeah, that was uh, I started out just on a whim of like, all right, it, it ha it, it, if this is true, then it has to be like this. And I got it and it was true. And I was like, all right, dedicating my life like the world needs this. Like nano engineering is cool and, and the world needs nano engineering. This is a way to make more nano engineers and empower them to create better technology. So then, <clears throat> I guess that's what seven, eight years ago that the the Oculus Kickstarter happened. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I think it was I like know, ten I know it years ago. Feel like a, yeah, I know it doesn't feel like that for the long Kickstarter. ago. Right? Yeah. yeah, it was about eight years ago when I got my headset. Yeah, twenty fourteen. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, we've come, we've come a long way in, in 2014. Come what was that? Yeah. I'm, I, I want to go back real quick. The magic mountain thing. Was that like the money for nothing dire straits video quality graphics, or was it a little bit better than that? Um, you know, I still have a bit of a memory. So it, it, it was Pac-Man was, was the actual application oh, that I tried. Okay. And, um, I, I don't know, maybe 480p at best, but probably, you know, lower, but. I don't, I don't know. All the graphics Some were pretty bad. But on not the, too many. On the, yeah, on the, on the TV screen, they like the graphics weren't even great back then, uh, just with the PlayStation. So it, it seemed to be on par with the other graphics okay. that I had been playing with. 
All right, so Pac-Man for N64 maybe, but in 3D right in front of your face because you got a VR headset on. All right, that's mm-hmm. not bad. Um, <clears throat> so uh, from a practical perspective, I mean, like I know enough about software engineering to, to, to know that somebody who's designing or doing anything with nano engineering, whether it's materials or, or drugs or whatever, the actual interactions that I guess you're probably trying to simulate then, right? Like the, the software needs to know that. So like, what is like somebody who's, who's, um, you know, let's say a drug designer, uh, who's actually putting the nano headset on or, or maybe an Oculus, you know, headset on, but your, your software, um, like, what is that actually, how do they actually interact with it? Are they, you know, putting two things together and, and you know, another piece of software is like simulating the interaction? Like, what does that actually look like? Um, yeah, well, yeah, you got it. Yeah, you put on the headset. Um, yeah, I have the Oculus, I think, over here and like um, the HTC Vive over there. We work with a, a ton of different VR headsets. Um, but you put it on and, and now you could uh, load and, and import and analyze different structures. Um, so a lot of the time when you're designing a molecule, um, it's not blind guessing like I, I thought it was when I was like, you know, eight, nine years old. Um, a lot of it is actually what they call rational drug discovery or structure based drug design, where you start with a, a protein receptor and you try to design you know, the key that's going to you know, fit tightly within that binding pocket. So a lot of the time um, you're actually analyzing the, the protein structure. You might dock some ligands in there and, and actually like see which ones are computationally going to bind with it. Uh, with that, you would run a docking software. Uh, we have an API that is compatible with many different types of docking software. Okay. And the idea that we have is like bring your own simulation because there's a lot okay. of really great open source academic software out there um, that out competes or is, is at least on par um, with these really sophisticated, um, you know, private expensive programs uh, that are out there in the computational chemistry space. Um, but some scientists don't trust those and some scientists trust others. So our philosophy is, all right, science is science. We're not reinventing science. We're reinventing the human interface of how we access and understand and interpret and collaborate and communicate around science. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so yeah. it's a fairly open platform then, like you're you're providing... You're providing, I think I made this comparison with somebody else the other day, but you're you're almost providing like the Zapier of of software here, where it's like you bring your own hardware. We're gonna connect it to you know, we're we're bringing this like middleware type thing, but you you can I guess the the actual interactive three D interface, uh, but you can actually bring your own simulation software. You got your drugs, you know, so whatever that's coded in, etc. And you're just giving them another way to visualize it, maybe visualize it better, uh, I guess, or else you, you probably wouldn't have much of a use case here. Um, and, and making it easier for them to, to figure out, you know, whether their hypothesis is going to work more or less. Is that pretty close? Oh uh, yeah, and, and everyone come up with you know, new hypotheses and, and new ideas, and, and you know, try to you know help them validate or invalidate them. You know, a lot of um, costs and drug discovery is actually working on things that end up failing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're able to to fail and, and get rid of uh, drugs from your pipeline earlier and, and pivot and change it and make something new, um, you're going to end up saving a lot of money on different assays and tests and synthesis and all that, as well as just time. You know, it's like it's all yeah. about time to market with with these drugs, because the sooner you get to market, the sooner you're improving patient lives or saving lives. Uh, the sooner these companies are able to to start making revenue and actually growing a business. Um, so yeah, you know, speeding up research and, and getting rid of those, those uh, compounds that are going to fail anyways and realizing that early on, but with new insights in VR. Yeah, I was, that was actually the word I was going to use next was was compound, like maybe eliminating one one ingredient from that compound, replacing it with another, you'd be able to figure that out a lot sooner. And I guess potentially actually drop the cost of these drugs because a, a big part of that of, of the reason, you know, uh, a shot of, I don't know, some new experimental cancer drug comes is like $1,000 each or $20,000 each is because it took them an, an inordinate amount of time and effort and money to to develop it in the first place. So if you can get that down by an, an, order, an order of magnitude, potentially, uh, they could actually come to market with a cheaper drug that is actually accessible to more people and you know whether it's in the states with with uh, you know mostly private healthcare uh, or here, which is mostly public healthcare, pu- publicly funded or publicly insured, um, everybody wins because 
the company probably beats competitors, you know, Moderna, Pfizer, whoever, uh, Glaxo, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, uh, you know, beats a competitor to market. That's great. They win. Uh, you know, their prices could be more affordable. It means more people can actually use it. And whoever's paying for it is, is happier as well because they're spending less on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, we try to work with uh, everyone, you know, uh, that wants uh, to do better science and, and help the world. Um, you know, like you were saying earlier, you know, choosing uh, the right people and, and making sure we do our due diligence. Um, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, the GSKs of the world are, are trying to, you know, design biological vectors. You know, they're trying to cure cancer awesome. and, and other diseases like that. <laughs> I mean, if Shkreli uh, takes over GSK, who knows what can oh, happen. No. But <laughs> thankfully, uh, he's in jail he's, right he's now. He's still in jail, so, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. He can't do anything from there. <clears throat> wow. I've heard he can do some stuff from there. But yeah, he's certainly not buying up GSK stock. At least I doubt it. Yeah. From, uh, from well, prison. I mean, yeah, he, he had to go through liquidation with that, that Wu-Tang Clan album. I'm still waiting for that to drop. <laughs> Thank so, you for was it Pleaser Dow, right? P P Pleaser Dow. Pleaser Dow bought, bought it. Right? Yeah, I, that's no, right. I, I, oh I, I love that. No, I love Pleaser Dow. Like they're they're awesome for doing that. Yeah, and I support it. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah, see yeah, everything you. comes back. Yeah, you know, thank it's, you it's for crazy. reminding me of all, that. You know, it's all connected. Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> talking yeah. about Screlly <laughs> and Pharma. No, no, no. Blockchain's gonna come back at you with this DAO. <laughs> It's, 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 it's always been Wu-Tang all the way down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh boy. Um, okay. So, so, you know, you're offering a virtual reality solution to drug design and research. Um, can you talk about, you know, how Nanom compares to uh, yeah, any other solutions out there that maybe are trying to compete with you, if there are any, and, and I don't know if there are off the top of my head, uh, or, you know, like why, well, I guess we've already covered, you know, why this is so much better, but like, you know, what, what does Nanom bring into the table that maybe others aren't? And you don't need to name names. I'm just, you know, just, just sure. You know, yeah. On I mean, there, there's some academic projects out there. Um, Cause I, I think the idea is like universal, right? You know, molecules are three dimensional, they're complicated. 2D mediums aren't the best way to do it. You need to have immersive media. And, and there's been stereo 3D glasses and all sorts of things. But yeah, the new head mounts of displays like the Oculus and, and the Vive and, and things that are mostly used for gaming, um, you know, getting onto those headsets makes a big difference. And so there are a few academic projects that are coming out of different universities um, that have made some attempt, uh, mostly educational. You know, they say, all right. You know, how do we teach science and make it more interactive and um, you know, let, let kids kind of play with it and, and learn by playing uh, with different models. And, and we think that's great. You know, we have our own uh, educational side as well, where we try to you know, help out with you know, biochemistry education. Literally, like every scientist we, we demo says, oh, man, I wish I had this in my OCHEM classes. Um, <laughs> and, and, and every non-scientist, you know, some of them say like, oh, I wish I had this in my OCHEM classes because then I wouldn't have dropped out and I might have actually been a scientist still instead of, you know, a, a biz dev guy or you know, whatever yeah. they ended up doing. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I'd say what sets us apart, though, from uh, you know, these academic projects it, is really working with the professionals that are, are working on the, the real drug discovery and you know, pharmaceutical biotech companies um, and, and building out the features that make it a, a rich professional experience that really just helps them with their drug development research. Uh, whether that's small molecule drug design, whether that's protein engineering and sort of you know, large molecule side. Um, yeah, like I don't think that uh, any of these uh, other academic projects really get much commercial traction mm -hmm. um, because it, it's an endeavor, you know, to, to make sure. a, a good tool that, you know, all these skeptical PhD level scientists are, are you know, really uh, just flocking to and saying, this is good. It's legit. I like the science in the background. Um, I think the front end is amazing. Like you, you have the features that I need to actually do my workflows and to make my job better. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm really just, yeah, being the, uh, the right tool for the right industry and, and, you know, working with everyone and, and keep making it better. Have, are you aware of any major, uh, uh, new releases <laughs> that have, that, uh, that Nanom software has had like a major role in, in making happen, whether it's quicker, faster, cheaper, et cetera, mm. over the last little while? 
that you can share obviously like i don't um, know if you guys have any strict ndas yeah. or anything like that but. well so yeah you, we, we do and, and big pharma is super <laughs> secretive but um the, the one i wanted to share which is public is uh, Oak Ridge national laboratories um so they've actually been designing uh covid antivirals um so you know if you if you get covid nowadays i believe you could get prescribed uh, certain pills from your doctor and you just you know take pills um they will try to help um, deactivate the virus in some way whether it's you know, blocking its replication or other methods. Um, so this one, uh, he was looking at the the main protease, which is kind of like a little like heart shaped, um, you know, protein. Uh, but if you fit a different molecule in there, you kind of stop it from from functioning and stop it from doing all the the protein cleaving. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they were able to to go into VR and design highly uh, potent compounds. Um, by you know literally getting in there and saying, oh, what if we built out this molecule in this way and tried to create these new interactions within you know, the binding pocket? Um, so I, I think they're you know uh, you know right now in early stages um, you know more potent than um, you know a lot of the other uh, protease inhibitor antiviral compounds uh, on the market. And um, yeah, you know they were able to do that by by using virtual reality and having their their smart scientists um, you know utilize all those back-end big data you know type of uh, uh simulation approaches in conjunction yeah. with you know a really good front end and having that human intuition um you know really driving the research process in vr that's really cool that's uh, that's good to hear hopefully um i mean you know hopefully this works out well in the sense that they can actually do trials a little bit more quickly you know adapt any changes they need to make if if that comes mm -hmm. out of the the trial process and, and get it to market a little bit sooner because i think we've all come to accept at least certainly southwestern ontario has more or less come to accept that covid's here forever at this point and it will continue yep. to mutate like the flu and like the cold that the common cold does every year which are all coronaviruses and um i guess i'm pretty sure they are <laughs> and, uh, um uh, well i mean there's, there's also the, the influenza virus but right um, influenza yeah, yes yeah. but like it's a lot of, a lot of colds are, are coronaviruses and, yeah. and, and yeah it's it's They're not like covid -19 too new but with, yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID nineteen that was very novel. You know the spike, the way it's all uh, laid out. It was a lot of yeah. you know new information for your body, and so we got all the vaccines. Yeah, I still got COVID after I got vaccinated, which yeah, you know, whatever. Same. That's just part of part of the world now. But hey, I'm a little bit more immune, and yeah, it seems like it's just something we all got to live with. So I, I'm glad that I got it over the winter break holidays uh, at the end of December. Mm -hmm. I guess when a lot of other people got it, but yeah, now yeah. it's just like, yeah, all right, yeah, I go to yeah. conferences, I meet people and I'm like, I just had COVID. No way I'm going to get COVID again this soon. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get that, boosted probably going into the, um, that was my next bet. season, but yeah, that was my bet. Uh, I, so I was already fully vaccinated, um, last year and then I got a booster, uh, early January and like right after that contracted COVID-19 but for me it ended up feeling like two days of really bad allergies and then mm -hmm. and then by like the, the the third or fourth day I actually tested because everybody else in my house started getting sick and so we all did a rapid test and we're like oh yeah look at that we all have COVID except for one of us um and maybe he already had yeah. COVID and we just didn't know right like it could have been asymptomatic yep. or whatever but he got quarantined <laughs> my oldest son <laughs> and uh, and he was fine with it. He's like, yeah, spend all day in my room watching TV, build, building Lego, playing video games. That's great. That's totally fine. Like he was 12 years old at the time. He's like, yeah, this is this is heaven. Um, <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> Not having to deal with my siblings. Food being brought to my door. Knock, knock, walk away. <laughs> He's totally fine with it. But um, yeah. Uh, and then deal. I went to East Denver in, Fe in February and I was like, I don't care how many people are here. I'm I'm. I'm double, I'm vaxxed, I'm boosted, and I just got COVID. Sure to goodness, I'm going to be fine. And I was, you know, I was one of, I'm sure many people, I, I know a few people who did get COVID, but I was one of many who didn't wear a face mask, met 10,000 people, and um, and came home fine. Yep. And, and, like, didn't bring home, yep. like, nobody else got sick in my house after I came home or anything like that. Yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm like, in the same boat. I test all yeah. the time. Like, if I go to a big conference, oh, I'm like, all right. I'm do my little at home nasal swab and, and do my <laughs> test. And yeah, it's all negative. I'm like, I'm negative. Okay, great. Like, I guess, yeah, I already, <laughs> already went through this. So yeah, um, yeah I, I have some immunity for a bit. Let's see how much it mutates. Um, you know, how long my antibodies stick around, you know, like, yeah, 
I'm trying to be responsible with it, but also, yeah, like you said, you know, the, the world's kind of, um, you know, just continuing on. Um, yeah. Like we shouldn't go into lockdowns unless we actually hit like hospital capacity. Like right. that's kind of the um, indicator. It's like, all right, if the hospitals are overflowing with people that are dying, your society yeah. has some big issues. Yeah. Which did um, happen early it's on. Not really like, hitting that. And yeah, exactly. It happened early on and that was a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I remember trucks in new york city being filled with bodies You're like that's that's awful obviously yeah, and, if, and if, certainly if we reach that point i will accept another lockdown but uh, yeah. uh unless we reach that yeah. point i'm kind of over it like i was a really good boy for two years but we're not there and yeah. and we're not there anymore and and i really just want to go on living my life that you know and, with and the so exception many people of going have been to... vaccinated and exposed yeah. to it yeah Exactly. You could get uh, antiviral pills shipped uh, shipped to your house, I, I guess. You know, if you're like at risk, you know, your doctor could prescribe mm. them to you and you could just, you know, start doing at home treatments. Like, you know, none of this stuff was around when the pandemic started. And yeah, yeah now we have all these options. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've definitely come a long way. And um, I like the only thing that really would concern me at this point would be a major, um, a major mutation that just makes it like, makes it just as bad as it was at the very beginning. Okay, then, you know, uh, again, I, I I might take more precautions. I might start wearing a mask again, etc. But at this point, I'm moving on. <laughs> and, and we should too. Um, so uh, I, I want to change tack a little bit here. Before we got started, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you're, you're, I mean, you've already mentioned a, a biodefense DAO. Uh, you, before we started, you talked about how you were into uh, decentralized science. We, t we also talked a little bit, like I said, about the recent volatility and Luna and UST and, and a few other things. And you, you revealed that you've been aware, at least, of, of cryptocurrencies for like eight to 10 years already. Tell us a little bit about that journey and, and what you're excited about with, uh, with, uh, with decentralized science. Yeah, um, it's just, I guess personal journey. I think it was like 2011 or so. Um, I was on Reddit, and um, I, I went to a website, and my my CPU spun up to like 100, percent and I was just like, "This is weird. This like this is sketch." And, and I went to the comments, and I was like, "All right, what's going on here?" And it was like, "All right, hey, this website runs a JavaScript miner for Bitcoin, and it's using your CPU to compute these hashes in order for the website host to make money." And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa." what they're making money off of my cpu running why don't i make money off of my cpu running <laughs> yeah why don't i start you know mining and so yeah i tried to get a yeah. little bit into mining but didn't really um i was in like a i don't know 10 cubic foot dorm uh I don't, i'm sure it was a bit bigger than that but it definitely felt like a tiny uh box at, at uc san diego and um i couldn't have the miner on 24 7 like i had to do schoolwork and i had to sleep and um you know, I, I think it was only going to make like a dollar a day or something. And I was just like, yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah. So, um, and, and Bitcoin was a dollar. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I decided man. like, you know, <laughs> hindsight, right? I, I, right. I, I had a very yeah. similar, very similar experience in 2015. I think it was, uh, so a little bit later than you, but like tried to mine, couldn't figure it out. I'm like, ah, forget it. A little bit of regret now, but yeah. It, you know, yeah, you, well, you, you, know, you made the decision I, I with the information it, you had at but... the time. Yeah, so it was 2011. I asked all my computer science friends, like, "Hey, what's up with this Bitcoin thing?" And they're like, "Ah, oh, it's a scam. I don't trust it." And I, I, I think that kind of influenced me. I was like, "All right, you know, if my smart CS friends are, are saying that it doesn't make sense, yeah, maybe it actually doesn't make sense." But yeah, I still read the white paper and went down the rabbit hole and just kept thinking about it until I bought it. And that was like maybe a year later or something. It was like hundred bucks by the time you know, I, I actually decided like, yeah, I'm making 12 bucks an hour. Like I'll just send it and I actually buy some, right. You got to buy some at some point. Um, did, did some cool stuff. Like you know, had a motorcycle, I used to ride around, uh, doing some like local Bitcoin. So I got to you know, meet a lot of people that were just, you know, getting started with Bitcoin themselves. And it was, it was a cool community back then. Um, and I remember, you know, there, there were some cool projects like Namecoin. I don't know if you remember Namecoin. It was like, yep. uh, dot bit domains and you could buy like a you know steve dot bit and and have all this but that never really went anywhere um just like the bitcoin network wasn't really built for that you know it was built for transactions and not really built for all these like 
layer two smart contract type ecosystems and, and yeah. you know the ENS now is a great example of what Namecoin could have been. Um, you, know, you have the Ethereum name uh, services. So um, yeah, that was my first foray into Bitcoin. Um, eventually decided to start mining, um, but by the time uh, you know, it was like 2013, 2014, um, that that I got into actual mining and I had a different place. Yeah, I moved off campus and was able to you know, have a bit more space to, to actually set up a computer. Um, it didn't make sense to mine Bitcoin because you needed ASICs. And you know, I had been a pre-order for um, one of the Butterfly Labs rigs, uh, but they never really like shipped and, and I was able to cancel my order. So that was great. But yeah, um, yeah I bought a GPU and I started mining Dogecoin. Uh, so that was fun, you know, because Dogecoin was like Bitcoin with memes. And so I really liked that. And it, of course, it was faster because it was using uh, the Litecoin type of uh, you know, script back end instead of SHA-256. Yeah. And, um, you know, it just had, you know, quicker block speeds, um, you know, big blocks, and, and you were able to, to do things cheaply. I remember people were goffing at, oh, God, how am I going to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks for three dollars if i need to pay two dollars or one dollar in transaction costs on bitcoin it's like that doesn't make sense and lo and behold it's way bigger than that but dogecoin was the way to do it you know dogecoin it was a fraction of a penny to to send a fraction of a penny and you would do that on reddit with um the dogecoin tip bot so i remember tipping people like you know uh you know a handful of dogecoin and being like yeah like good posts and it's a fraction of a penny at that point but you know, now like your, you know, hundred Dogecoin is, you know, like uh, 10 bucks or whatever it, it, it's going at. Like, you know, it's, um, it, it's actual money now, uh, which is kind of cool to see that these random, uh, you know, tips are actually worth something. And then, um, it's, yeah, I got into Ethereum for the smart contracts and, and, uh, yeah, what was that? I was gonna say, is it actually money though? Like <laughs> I still, I still, <laughs> I, I, I have no Doge just because I, I feel more or less the same way I do about Bitcoin, which is like, yeah, you can use it to pay people for stuff. And, you know, and it's relatively quick and, and inexpensive. Oh, apparently you can also buy Doge on BNB Smart Chain. <laughs> but, interesting, you know, it's still, uh, uh, you know, it's you're still mining it. Um, you know, it's proof of work, which generally speaking is bad mm-hmm. for the environment. Um, you know, obviously it's highly, highly volatile. Like, do you really think that that sort of, cryptocurrency has a long-term role to play in in the space or you know or 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 do you think it's just a good gateway drug for for people to get in because there's memes and it's cheap yeah okay so i well i don't think that those two options are mutually exclusive um yeah i think it can be a good gateway currency which you know it's got memes it's fun it's it's easy to buy transact right you send it to your friends on, on a smartphone and and you can just do the QR code scan and boom, boom, fraction of a penny to transact. Like you just kind of get into the swing of what crypto actually is supposed to be about, which is peer to peer. So I think, yeah, the, like it itself as an onboarding tool to, for the masses to get into you know, the, the broader blockchain ecosystem, I think is great. And it has value there. Um, you know, can it be used for transactions? Um, yeah, I'd like to see more merchants accepting it. Um, yeah, I certainly bought uh, a bunch of swag from the Tesla store when when they started accepting Dogecoin. Yeah, I got like a belt buckle, I got a hat, a beanie, um, and it was just like, yeah, like this is this is cool. Like I could finally buy some stuff with Dogecoin. Um, I'm not a big like buy this just to sell it at a higher price and convert back to USD later. Like that right. to me, it's just like that's not the point of all this. The point of all this is to actually use it in the way that. It's supposed to be used and Dogecoin being used as a you know, medium of exchange uh, when transacting goods between different parties. Um, you know, it's great. It functions. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it has value because it's functional. Um, I, I, I still, you know, like other, you know, platforms that have smart contracts and, you know, they're switching over to proof of stake, but I, I don't think Dogecoin is going away just because other, you know, platforms are, are growing and becoming better. Um, it's like each thing has its own place in the ecosystem. Fair enough. And uh, and so, how do we get now to decentralized science, and why why you're uh, excited about that? Yeah. Um. So we actually, uh, you know, so so I, I guess back to you know my blockchain journey. So in 2014, when I got the the VR headset, I was like, all right. Yeah, all my arbitrage trading days are over. You know, like I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm, I'm going to focus down and do all this VR stuff because this is what's actually going to help the world. 
Right. And um, yeah, I started uh, yeah, just doing all the VR stuff and was like, all right, you know, whatever. Sure enough, like I, I meet um, uh, people who would eventually you know, be my co-founders. Um, you know, had some friends that uh, also joined the company as well. You know, uh, our CTO, you know, he paid for his uh, college. Um, his parents didn't support him. He didn't get scholarships. He paid for it out of his Bitcoin. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was awesome that he did that. And um, you know, another that co-founder, awesome. our COO, you know, he had also been into Bitcoin. And so... I ended up doing this, you know, virtual reality uh, science company with other people that were also super into blockchain. Nice. And um, sure enough, Ethereum rolled around. Um, I think I found out in 2014, 15 about Ethereum. and was like, all right, I know I'm doing all this VR stuff, but I'm just going to dabble on this because I, I like the idea. I want to use smart contracts. I want to actually, you know, make my own stuff. And, and in order to do that, I'm going to need Ethereum. And so I bought some Ethereum. And uh, sure enough, you know, 2017 rolled around. Um, you know, our VR platform had, had actually gotten some commercial traction with Pharma um, by then. Um, you know, we, we kept growing it, and we had this idea of, all right, how do we crowdsource and decentralize all this? Um, if you know, there's a popular game called uh, Fold It, and with Fold It, it's like all these gamers that are you know, dragging their mouse trying to like predict protein structures. You know, before Alpha Fold came out, this was kind of you know, one of the ways to you know, potentially predict you new know, protein structures was with human insights. Right. And, um, you know, we had this idea of like, all right, well, why don't we allow that for drug development and have all these people looking at the binding pocket and making new drugs that might fit inside of it and crowdsource that and run different competitions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, you know, apparently we weren't the only ones thinking about this. That same lab that did fold it had also thought about this. We talked with one of their former um, you know, grad students that had been in that lab. And uh, the idea is cool, but the implementation, it seemed impossible because University of Washington wanted to own all the IP of all the gamers. Um, but then the, the lab thought it, you know, the gamers should own their own IP, but then managing that was a disaster. And, you know, we kind of saw the same thing, but we saw blockchain as a solution of like, all right, well, if you design a drug, hash it on chain. And if right. you hash it on chain, you now have a, an immutable timestamp that shows that you were the first creator. Um, so we made this whole platform around that idea to help you know, crowdsource different research projects, whether than drug discovery or other areas as well. Um, and this whole concept was first to hash. Um, if you know about the, the patent system, uh, we're currently on first to file. It used to be first to invent. Um, but you know, we're believers that the future is going to be first to hash. And we could help you know, kind of decentrally build this, this future um, by just implementing you know, the right smart contracts on the blockchain and building that out. Um, so that was our first foray into you know what is now called decentralized science, um, but yeah, you know, we just called it like you know, decentralized research platform, something like that. Um, and, you know, DeSci is a, a very catchy thing, and and I think that you know a lot of the people that are in DeSci now um, didn't ever exist in in 2017. So um, yeah, we were kind of one of the first that were doing decentralized science in, in meaningful ways and. Um, you know, nowadays there's all these, you know, DAOs that are popping up and yeah, I think the infrastructure that we built with the smart contracts on Ethereum could even be used internally within DAOs because, you know, if you have a distributed team around the world developing new compounds, like, yeah, you want to make sure that, you know, these things get attributed to the DAO, they get attributed to the, you know, addresses and the people within the DAO that actually made them. Right. Um, and you encourage people to really be sharing this information on a more frequent basis. Um, so, yeah, you know, nowadays, like. I think that there's important causes in the world that are traditionally underfunded in the in the VC and, and private equity and, and biotech pharma world, and um, I think biodefense is one of them. Where um, you know, if you're if you're going around pitching uh, your startup and there's not this way to make huge amounts of money directly by saying, all right, we got 10 million patients globally and they have this disease, and if we make this drug, we're going to make you know 10 billion dollars a year by by you know helping their lives, like. Yeah, that's kind of the, the framework. But if you say, hey, I want to make drugs and, and vaccines and other things for potential future pandemics, maybe now it's a little bit hot, uh, I guess, you know, with COVID-19 and everything happening, um, but it's still traditionally underfunded. And so that's where I think, you know, DAOs could really help out is, um, you know, bringing people together to, to really help with these um, these these causes that humanity needs that, um, yeah, just uh, might be underfunded. Yeah. 
you know what? I think that's a great place to leave it <laughs> on a, on a, on a <laughs> positive note of where, where we're heading. Um, Steve, if people want to, you know, keep in touch with what you're saying, what you're doing or, or, um, uh, I'll oh, shoot. Uh, I know uh, with what Nanome is, uh, is up to, where should they, uh, where should they go? Yeah. Best place is our website, uh, nanome.ai, N-A-N-O-M-E.ai. Uh, if you do, uh, nanome.com, it forwards anyways, uh, we also have that domain. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that'll get you, uh, exposed to, to what we're doing on the site, you know, a ton of different YouTube videos you can follow. Of course, if you have your own VR headset at home, we're available. Um, you know, all the major stores, you know, Oculus, we're on the app lab, uh, HTC and Vive, we're on the, the regular thing. You can just, you know, search Nanome and download us. Um, yeah, you can follow us on socials, you know, at Nanome underscore Inc on, on Twitter and a lot of others. And uh, yeah, you know, just connect with us in the metaverse. You know, we're, we're the ones building the science metaverse. And, you know, if, if you're into DSI or if you're into immersive technology, if you're just into science, uh, you know, really Nanome is, is building your dream tools. So, so check it out. That's awesome. Thanks a lot. And thanks for spending some time with us uh, again today. And for everybody listening, until next time, stay free.